Okay, good afternoon, and uh, thanks, Wolfgang. I don't speak German, so I can just assume that what he said about me was nice. Uh, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go with that. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of who I am here. And let me see if I can make this thing work the way it is supposed to. There we go. Okay, so what I, what I would, uh, thought I would talk about this afternoon is this notion of reciprocal action. And it's in, uh, it's in Clausewitz, and we find that the wrong way, okay. All right, ah, I got it. So the Chinese are not in the network today. Okay, so what, um, uh, yeah, there we go. So one of the things when, uh, when uh, General Peschel sent out the uh, announcement that we were going to talk about, there was an assumption in there, and the assumption was that war is a clash of wills that are separate from each other. And what I am going to propose is that that is not the case. And I'm going to propose that Clausewitz actually saw that. He hinted at the fact that that was the case, that it was that this notion of reciprocal action was something that he saw but he doesn't write a lot about it, and I would suggest one of the reasons is because he was still trying to, to find his place, if you will, in the, in, the literature, in the literature on the theory of war. And he wasn't confident enough in his own, in, in, his, in this particular belief. Now, that's just my interpretation. But the other thing that I think is important about this, from the time that I have spent uh, in, in the Pentagon and in the upper levels of U.S. government strategy making, the strategic assumptions that we make, we, the big we, when we start to create strategy are things that we unconsciously carry with us the whole time that we're developing a strategy. So that if you believe that we are separate in a very distinct way from the other, from the adversary, that will drive you in a particular direction as you begin to think about creating a strategy. If, on the other hand, you believe that war instead is more of a mimetic process, it's more of a process of imitation, of imitation of the other, than it is a process of my being different from the other, as it were. And what I would suggest is that that mimetic process, that reciprocal action, drives war towards extremes that politics ultimately will not be able to control. And again, remembering in Clausewitz, he talks about how politics would, have, would be able to control this. And I believe that that is not entirely the case as we go forward here. Again, no plan survives first contact. We all know that. We all understand that. There's learning that goes on on both sides. So for me to create a plan and say this is the way things are going to be is naive at best because as soon as you contact the enemy, whether it's operationally, whether it's tactically, or whether it's in a strategic sense, the enemy is learning from you and you are learning from the enemy and that is the, your plan is evolving as that happens. Again, if you think about the way we learn, we learn by imitation. Imitation is the, is the principal way that children learn to do things. So as we talk about learning from the enemy, I would suggest that this imitation, if you will, is, is exactly what we are doing. We are learning from the, uh, from the enemy the whole time that we're going on, that we are ongoing. And that makes imitation, which is the, the, the basis of reciprocal action, that's what makes it so important. Again, the uh, breaking this style, uh, this this uh, this this uh, cycle, understanding what it is that um, what laws, if there are any, govern imitation, govern reciprocal action, is I think important. And what I'm going to propose to do here, as we go on, um, as soon as I figure out a rhythm between that and that right there, um, we will talk about how we can understand better what's happening in terms of this uh, mimetic action. Okay, so here's what Clausewitz says. Again, we see the possibility that politics cannot contain reciprocal mimetic action. This is his quote. He said, each side, therefore, compels its opponent to follow suit. A reciprocal action is started, which must lead, in theory, to extremes. So 
he is saying that this is, in fact, this, and, he, and again, there's a lot of contradiction in Clausewitz, as you all know. Again, then he goes on to say that two different sides of the conflict are driven by two primary impulses, right? One is hostile feelings, and the other is hostile intent. And then he goes on to say that savage people are ruled by passions, civilized people, what he had in mind for the enlightenment, ruled by the mind. But he always equivocates. And at the end, he equivocates again. And he says, even the most civilized of people, in short, can be filled with a passionate hate for each other. So what I think he's trying to get at here is that there is, in fact, this notion of feeling as opposed to thinking that, that in his mind, is, this is, he's seen something. And I'll give you an example of what I think he's seen later on that leads him to believe this. So in spite of what he tends to write, he continues to equivocate about this notion of, of excuse me, of passionate hatred. And again, I would suggest that the power of politics to be able to contain this trending towards extremes is in fact uncertain. And it's uncertain because of this mimetic action, because the reciprocal action and here's an example of what happens when we reach extremes. So you're all familiar in the First World War with the issues of mobilization, right? When, when the actual conflict started, as France began to mobilize, Germany said, well, we have to mobilize now because of the timetables, because of the, of the railway timetables. That's an example of mimetic action, if you will, of reciprocal action. The next thing that you see is in the trenches they begin to mirror each other at the tactical and operational level as we set off these trench lines and we go about slamming into each other for the next four years. In the Second World War, you had the development of totalitarianism, right? You had the, the, the development, the 20th century manifestation of totalitarianism between Stalin and Hitler. And again, but the ultimate reciprocal action turns out to be the atomic bomb as we continue to go back and forth building bigger and better and faster weapons, we eventually got to the point where we built this weapon and then what happens? The Russians and the Chinese are gonna build weapons just like it as we go forward. Then the Cold War, mutual assured destruction, which is still a theory today that is talked about in the Pentagon and in the United States. And it's fascinating to me because it's trying to, people have tried to invoke this theory as a way of thinking about cyber, related um, uh, deterrence, if you will. But the, the analogy breaks down if you understand the technology. And here's the reason why. Because in mutual assured destruction is based, literally based on the fact that one country, Russia or the United States, could sustain a first strike by the other country and still have enough nuclear weapons to be able to completely vaporize the other country. That's what's meant by it. So there's a piece, in, and it was mentioned a little bit earlier um, about resilience in, in the world of, for instance, of cyber. What that would mean is that you would have to have networks that are resilient enough to be able to stand an attack and still be able to fight back and fight through it. That's what mutual assured destruction means, and I'm not so sure that that analogy is gonna work in the world of cyber. In, uh, you saw what happened with the United States in Vietnam, right? The longer we stayed in that country the, and in that war, the more our tactics at the tactical level began and our activities and behaviors began to become more and more like the enemies, okay? And then in Afghanistan, the Russians went in there first and then not to be outdone, we had to go back a few years later and find ourselves in the same situation where we find ourselves fighting an enemy and we begin to look more and more like that enemy as the longer that we fight them. And, and this is, in, in American history, uh, during the Philippine insurrection, the Spanish-American War, the United States put a large number of Army soldiers into the Philippines. And those are the days before, obviously, the internet television. This is like the 19-teens kind of time frame. And it wasn't until the reporters started to come back from the Philippines reporting about the behavior of American troops in the counterinsurgency against the Hucks that the, the political support for it went away. And why was that? Because the activities were becoming more and more like them. What's gonna happen next? It's gonna be some, this world of cyber, and we just uh, briefly, uh, Jamie mentioned it before, but I would encourage all of you as you think about
if you think about cyber-related strategies, especially in the terms of mimetic action, I do something to you, you do it back to me, understand the technology. It, 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 would, it would be very useful to get into, um, to get fairly deep into it so that you understand what it means technically to do something. Otherwise, the strategy discussions bereft of this, of, of that basic foundational knowledge will be incoherent, quite frankly. Because the strategy discussions that we have with regard to conventional weapons, most of us in this room have a pretty good idea because of your background or because you've studied it of what conventional weapons and conventional forces are capable of doing. But in the world of cyber, it's just a whole, it's, it's just different. And, and it just, I'll give you an example. Okay. So the, if you're going to do something against another country's networks, let's say, there's a couple of things that are required. One of them is that you have to have access into those, electronic access into those, access of some sort into those networks, whether it's electronic, whether it's a spy with a thumb drive, whatever it happens to be. The challenge is if you do something, you now have given away that you've given away the fact that you're there. They know you're there now. So there's a trade-off technically that causes you to have this trade-off between intelligence gathering and conducting operations. And in order to, to really internalize that, it's necessary to understand uh, the technology. Again, some of the other discussions that you'll hear in Washington and you'll see in the paper is how do you respond to a cyber attack, right? So Clausewitz, I would suggest, would suggest that mimetic action, reciprocal activity, reciprocal action will take over. And the tendency will be to respond to a cyber attack in kind with another cyber attack. So all of you would sit there and think about whether or not that makes sense strategically. Because now you're in a tit for tat with the same kind of capability. Would it be perhaps smarter, would it be better if you had a strategy that allowed for you to respond in another way to a cyber-related attack? And the issue of will and deterrence, you can only deter a cyber attack with cyber capabilities if you have, if you're willing to, um, to use them in a way that's going to expose the capability that you have, all right? So, for example, if somebody wanted to see what the U.S. tactical aviation capability is, you can go to the Paris Air Show and watch an F-35, or you can see video footage of the Israeli F-35s on TV, and you know what that airplane can do. But in the world of cyber, it's a bit different than that, and people like to, to not make that so visible. So just something to think, think about as we, uh, as we go forward. René Girard is a, a contemporary <laughs> French philosopher who um, I think has a, a very uh, interesting perspective on what Clausewitz said here. Because he said, Clausewitz doesn't tell you what happens when you reach an extreme. Why? Because it's a theory. It's a theory of war. But again, as you know, he goes back and forth between the practical side and the theoretical side. So if we don't know what happens when we get to the extremes, we can, quote, only imagine. But what Girard believes is that when Clausewitz was, was conducting or was developing this theory, he put his finger on something. He realized that there was an, an irrationality to the way that people responded that he just wasn't, I would suggest, as comfortable with as he was with the more rational um, responses that, uh, that he outlines in the book. And the strategist that, that Girard is talking about here, of course, is Jomini, right? So. Oh, shoot, what did I do? Did I go too far? Um, thank you. Okay. The Enlightenment. So Clausewitz is a child of the Enlightenment, obviously. The Enlightenment highlights and privileges individuality. It privileges rationality. It privileges the notion that you and I can sit and talk about something, and we can come to an agreement. And to show you just how deeply this goes, this notion, and it's still alive today, if you look at some of the public pronouncements that President Bush and President Obama, two very different people, have mentioned with regard to foreign policy and with regard to foreign actors, 
They, it, they have, have, in so many words, both of them at different times have said, I just don't understand why we can't just sit down and reason our way through whatever this problem is, right? Well, that's the reason, that's the enlightenment. That's the holdover from the enlightenment that's still on us. And I would suggest that Clausewitz actually saw the end of this, even though he was a very much a child of this. Again, perhaps memetics, perhaps this notion of reciprocal action is going to be the new rationality. The new rationality is not that you and I reason about something, but that we feel something. We're not thinking about it, we're feeling it, and that I know that you are going to respond in a way that I have anticipated because I have actually done that first. And it, it's different because in strategy, of course, you want the enemy to do some particular thing, and you think if I do this, the enemy will do that. But what if you came at it from a different standpoint and said, well, if I do this, then ultimately the enemy is going to do the same thing back to me. And how does that, does that dynamic affect the way I think about strategy? One of the things that happened in Clausewitz's time was the total mobilization uh, and conscription of the French army, right, when he saw Napoleon. And I'll talk a little bit about the Battle of Almay here in a minute, but this is one of the things that he sees, that conscription is, brings the entire body of a nation to war. Prior to that, it was fought, as you well know, mainly by mercenaries, people that were paid to fight, that fought war. At, war was an institution then. It wasn't something that required the utter and complete destruction of the enemy. So, again, when I think about nuclear deterrence, I, I've had very animated conversations with people of, of, at all levels in the United States about this last bullet, about whether or not we ought to be we ought to be hiring anthropologists to work in the defense department than political scientists. This is not a science, it's an anthropology. Where are the anthropologists? Where are the cultural anthropologists? Where are the people that understand the way we react and deal with each other? Thinking of conflict in, uh, in terms of this, we still tend, as that last bullet says, in my mind, we still tend to think of ourselves separately as a mind and a body as opposed to an embodied thing. And again, this comes again from the Enlightenment, that we can reason our way out with, with the power of our mind. We get this from Kant, we get this from Descartes, we get this from, but in fact, we're not. We are a jumble of contradictory feelings. We are a jumble of contradictory thoughts. And I think that it would be wise for us to think of conflict in that terms. And we do when we look at some smaller conflicts and we look at other countries and we, and especially when we look back in history and we say, my God, why would they, these people savagely fight each other to the death? But what I don't think we do is try to understand enough of the dynamics that went into, into that. Okay, September 20th, 1792. I'm, I am going to make an assumption that Clausewitz was there because Clausewitz was in the army at that time and this was a, say what? And, and what was different about this battle? What was different about this battle is that the French soldiers stood and fought. They hadn't until then. The Prussians had run over them. And this cry of Viva la Nation was heard across the battlefield. And if you read, as I have, some of the reports at, in the battlefield, apparently you could hear this cry from the French soldiers when the cannonades, as they would roll through there and there would be a pause while they reloaded the cannons. So this was, this was uncomfortable for the Prussian soldiers when they heard this because this was the first indication, and I would suggest that Clausewitz actually, this made him uncomfortable, but he recognized this. this was, there was something at work here that was different than the way that we'd been thinking of war prior to that, that there was a transition that we were going through here and again, this notion of battle lust, depending on how you translate his, it takes priority over reasoning. And it redefines the extremes. The last bullet there, I would suggest that the way humans react to each other, you do as much as is necessary to gain superiority or to gain control over something or someone. And if you hold back, what you have done, then the tendency in reciprocal action would be for your opponent to hold back in some way. That, I think, works the other way in terms of escalation. 
the more you put into something, the more your opponent is going to put into something, kind of like worldwide wrestling, if you know what I mean. At times they, you know, and Clausewitz uses this, this um, metaphor a lot when he talks about wrestlers, right? So if you look at wrestlers, and I, and I got it, most of it's all made up, but it's, it's entertainment. If you watch the way they behave with each other, there are periods of great activity and then there's periods when there's not great activity, when they're trying to kind of catch their breath, if you will. That's what I think is, is going on here. This, the Enlightenment notion of human autonomy, the fact that we by ourselves, this is why I think it's so important that we think more in terms of anthropology than we do in terms of political science as we think about strategy. Because this notion that we by ourselves can cause something that we operate autonomously, uh, I, I just don't think that's the case. We certainly there are individuals that cause things to happen, but we all operate in the social context or the moral context in which we live. The organization we're a part of, the nation we're a part of, and if you look at the at the war on at terrorism, for example, terrorism characterizes itself as a response to aggression. If you read anything that the terrorists have written, and that goes all the way back to the. To, uh, to our good friends, the, the, the Brits, who have at times accused me or the United States of being the first terrorist because of what we did in the Boston Harbor. But it's always a response to something else because you need to have that rationale. And the rationale comes from, I'm just responding to what he did to me. The war on terrorism, again, I would, <laughs> if you look at this, quote, war on terrorism, which is really interesting, is having, you know, war on a noun is, is sort of a nod thing. But, but if, you, if you look at the way that, has, that war has gone, you begin to see uh, similarities in both the way it's being executed by um, people on, that believe they're on the side that's been wronged and by the, the terrorists. And, and quite frankly, they both believe they're wronged, right? The terrorists attacked. Uh, attack a target, and the target that's attacked believes that it's responding to that aggression, and that country goes back at them again. But you find, you begin to find a similarity in the tactics that they use as the longer the war goes on. Again, the thing about um, reciprocal action, technology today exacerbates this in such a, 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 um, a significant way because what used to take 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. I mean, back in the day, the, when they were looking at the uh, theory of mutual assured destruction, the thought was, depending on where the missile came from and depending on where it was going, it had to go over the North Pole, and whether we shot at the Russians or they shot at us. And the time of flight of those things was in the 15, 20 minute time frame, somewhere in that area that you had enough time to make a decision about whether you were gonna react. If you're gonna launch a cyber attack today, that means I'm gonna press this button right here and the effect is, could be instantaneous. And it could be like right now. Will it? Eh, not necessarily. There's a lot of technical things involved with sending things through networks to make them do exactly what you want them to do. But the fact of the matter is that the technology compresses that. It's the fact that everything's on YouTube, that everything's on the internet, that it comes right now, that it's getting tweeted from the combat zone and people feel obligated to make, uh, to have a response to that that exacerbates what I would consider to be this trending towards extremes, and it exacerbates this reciprocal action, and it makes it even more powerful of a dynamic because everything is compressed where you don't have the time to think. Um, earlier this week, I gave a presentation at the other uh, um, conference on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and one of the things that I postulated in there was that one of the reasons the crisis was diffused was because the Americans and the Russians had time to think this over the course of six days. There wasn't, and in some cases it was Kennedy doing something intentionally, in other cases it was Khrushchev, to give themselves time to think this thing through. And that's the danger today with technology. So as we develop strategies, as we think about strategic thinking in general, and we start to think about effects of doing these kinds of things, if we think about this in terms of reciprocal action and we think about compressing that so that you, if I'm gonna do something to you, I've almost got to anticipate that something's gonna come back to me the exact same way and I've gotta be thinking about how I'm gonna respond to that before I ever 
press that button to say, okay, I'm going to send this thing heading that way, whether it's a missile, whether it's a piece of malware, whatever it happens to be. Okay, violent immediate response, and again, the thing about technology, it, it lessens the effects of politics. And if you, if all you have to do is look at what's going on in the world today to realize that with the advent of Twitter, with the advent of YouTube, with the advent of Facebook, that, that politics doesn't have the opportunity anymore to be the mitigating process here, the mitigation of this tending towards extremes. You know, on Facebook, which is where most of the people in the demographic in this room, uh, not most of you personally, but people that, are, that tend to be from, the cutoff is about 65 and older, they get their news from Facebook. What they don't, what, what I have, it's come to my attention since I did some research on this, people don't realize is that the algorithms in Facebook, when you dial up something, it sends you the click is to something more extreme. And every time you click on a more extreme news site, the, the algorithm in Facebook will now take something else away so that within weeks, all you're seeing on your Facebook news is what you want to see, is what the algorithm thinks you want to see. So just think about it. You have narrowed all of your news down to just one, uh, to one particular type of uh, perspective and it gets angry and, and, and so that's one of the things that, that, that technology is doing to us today and we just need to understand that so we can think about how we can mitigate that if we can and to what extent. The um, Clausewitz was looking at the quote gentlemen's wars, right? So prior to the French Revolution you had uh, a, a great deal, mercenaries, right? And a king that would go to war would generally not do something that was going to cause him to lose large numbers of troops because if he did, that way he had to pay money to get those mercenaries to fight for him. So he would lose his power base. When you have conscription and when you have a large number, I mean, the French troops that came out that volunteered to march with Napoleon to free Europe, they that Napoleon didn't have the same sense until he was coming back from Moscow, I would suggest, of trying to preserve the Grand Army because it, there was always somebody else that was going to come behind him that was going to volunteer. That change is what I think Clausewitz saw and what he didn't actually uh, spend a lot of time in, uh, in, on war talking about, but there's enough hints in there and I showed you a couple of them earlier where he's equivocating about this notion that rationality is going to be the, uh, the overarching uh, way that we are going to settle uh, these issues. Modern wars, they're not more violent at a one-on-one -on -one basis than they were. I mean, if you're going to run somebody through with a pike or you're going to shoot them in the head, I mean, there's a lot of personal violence that's going on. But at scale, it, at the scale that you can do things today because of mobilization, because you can mobilize an entire country, because you can now mobilize them and move an entire country, because you can arm an entire country in a way that you couldn't before. That, I think, is, is one of the things that is the, the outcome or the output, if you will, of this reciprocal action. The, uh, you know, if you think about this, there's been a lot of discussion recently on both sides of the Atlantic about a strategy to escalate to de-escalate, okay? If you think about it, the way I'm looking at this, that is, a, that is a dangerous strategy because it encourages the kind of reciprocal action that I'm talking about here, so just an example. And, and then what I mentioned earlier about you know, the fact that nobody feels like the aggressor. It almost, in the 20th century, you needed to have an excuse to do something. It, it, it seemed in the grand scheme of things, there had to be a rationale for you to attack someone or some country. And this notion, I'm only doing this because they did it to me. Why did they do it? They started it. Somebody started it and your rationale, whether it's an act of terrorism, whether it's crossing a border, whatever it is, I'm simply reciprocating for what had already happened to me. And I think if you look at that language and you think about that concept, that to me is, is what is at work here underneath all of this. Okay. The, this is, uh, this is the last chart that I wanted to just kind of end this discussion or to, to end this part of the presentation. Uh, 
So is the Enlightenment dead? No, it's not. The point that I'm trying to make here is that individualism and the way that we've looked at individualism is not the way that the world actually is today, and it's clearly not the way that we have been moving in the 20th century. And I think that Clausewitz saw this. He just doesn't come right out and say it, but he hints at it throughout his, uh, um, throughout his uh, book. So the notion of uh, ritualized warfare, one of the other things that Girard, uh, Rene Girard postulates is that warfare prior to the Enlightenment or prior to the French Revolution was a way of sort of uh, solving problems. It was seen as a way to solve an issue between two countries, but it was never at the point of completely and utterly destroying any, either one of them. I mean, even the, the legend of the Carthaginian peace turns out not to be quite as true as we'd like to think it is in salt in the earth with the folks in Carthage, if you're not familiar with it. But, but this, this issue of unconditional surrender, where'd this come from? Well, actually, I think it came, I know for sure, one of the people that used it were American presidents that said, we are going to demand the unconditional surrender of a country. What does that mean? That means that I've got to utterly destroy the capability of that country to do anything. What does that mean? It means I'm going to drive myself to an extreme. I'm taking options off the table to have a peace that is anything short of complete and utter subjugation. That's what I mean by the institution of warfare changing. It has become this, this, ex, this extreme way of, of um, imposing your will in a way that knows no bounds because it continues to escalate. And unconditional surrender now puts both the person that declared it, if I'm saying that I'm in this war and I'm going to demand the unconditional surrender, I have now put myself in a position where I can accept nothing else. And that nothing else means that the enemy now is going to fight me to the absolute end. And if you look at the, at the, the um, American experience with the Japanese in the Second World War, you see a lot of that going on. So it's just something to think about. But, it, but as we banty this notion around, that to me, the unconditional surrender, is another example of this trending towards extremes, and which means that I've got to be able to get back to the antebellum before the war. Whatever the order was, I'm going to destroy that other country's army, government, economy, so I can get back to where I was before, which is a quaint notion because you can never get back to where you were before. Once you start this, and Clausewitz does say this, he says no one should ever embark on a war without knowing the implications of what it is he's getting ready to do. And lastly, again, we have not shown in the 20th century, particularly nor since the beginning of the 21st century, an ability to control this mimetic action. And if anything, we have, our tendency has been to take it to greater extremes, and it has been, and technology has exacerbated that in a way that makes this even more of an imperative, makes it more of an imperative that we think about this. And the last thing I would leave you with before I take your questions is, so if you're trying to develop a strategy, or you're trying to think strategically about how you, your country, your business, your organization is going to deal with the world, if you think about the other as, as an entity that is going to mimic what you do and imitate what you do, and that you're both learning off of that, and that is going to tend to drive you in the world of warfare towards greater and greater and greater extremes. And politics again, I would suggest, is proving itself incapable of mitigating that today. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I think if we start by being more aware of what is happening and more aware of what the technology is causing to happen because it has conf conflated, if you will, and it has compressed the amount of time that we have to think about reactions to other things. You know, in the world of cyber, we have this argument all the time, which is if I'm attacked by someone else, who do I have to go to to get permission to go back and to where that came from? And contrary to what you might hear in the paper, there's a rather convoluted way of doing that. And it, when I first got involved in this, I thought, this makes no sense. We need to, we have the technology. If this happens, I'm just going to let this AI, this agent loose, and it's going to know what to do. 
Well, the challenge is if you get more and more into the technology, you realize that it's going to do things you didn't want it to do. And it's going to learn on its own, as AI does. And as it gets into a network and it starts learning about things, you may find it going in a place you never anticipated. So just a way to think about this reciprocal action is kind of the bigger sort of overarching piece. And, and again, I, uh, I would suggest that our friend Clausewitz was, uh, was far more prescient about this than, uh, than most of us give him credit for, and that he was, and it was because of the people that he was around, because of his culture, that he was a little more hesitant to come right out and say it, but that again, rereading re book one again and again, or chapter one, I found some indications that he was at least leaning in that direction and appreciated what the, the sensibilities, if you will, of feeling as opposed to thinking and where that was going to take him in terms of reciprocal action, uh, ultimately to an extreme. So thank you very much for your attention. didn't promise you too much. That was what I said in my introduction. Uh, the general is firm in pedagogics, logics, ethics, whole philosophy, war theory. So that is what I said in the beginning. Uh, and it was a convincing uh, presentation. What, what struck, struck me uh, most is that you said, I, I haven't read that, uh, that Clausewitz already said, that reciprocity is something, reciprocal action is something for gentlemen's war. It should have to end after gentlemen's war. That's very interesting, and, and I think uh, one, one example could be found with Hannibal and the Portas of Rome, mm -hmm. because Hannibal believed in a kind of codex of honor. Mm -hmm. The Romans did not. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is a very good, a very, very new finding. Thank you very much for that. First question, General, please. Uh, Robert, that was really a masterpiece of an analysis of Clausewitz. How far, to what extent, it can be used for modern strategic planners or military strategic planners or so. And my question is what you presented altogether could be a philosophy of those who have to do this. And my, question, my second question is up to what extent is that now understood by your government, by those who do this officially, is that also an element of your, for example, military strategy or strategy? That's a great point. So um, as the general knows, because he's gone to one of our war colleges, our U.S. war colleges, we don't teach Clausewitz this way. We teach Clausewitz very traditionally, and we teach the Trinity, and we teach it, at what I would suggest, is, a, is a, a level that is not deep enough for people to truly understand this. One of the things that I am trying, that I am personally trying to do is in my discussions and my lecturing at the war colleges and other places uh, that I do these days is to introduce students, lieutenant colonels, and I'm going to do this with uh, one-star generals here in a couple of weeks, introduce them to this notion that there is more in Clausewitz that you need to, if you're going to speak up at some forum and say, hey, didn't Clausewitz say this, it would be helpful if you knew this. Because what's happened is that Clausewitz, the traditional thinking of Clausewitz has gotten into and is very deeply routed and rooted in the American military. And if you just think about the way that you hear uh, people in uniform in the, in the um, U.S. military talking about centers of gravity and, and using all of the Clausewitzian language, but trying in some cases, I think, to apply it inappropriately because it's looked upon more as a way to, to sort of, I can put this in a context that I can understand as opposed to trying to challenge yourself to think about, about this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I proposed that, uh, which was shot down vehemently by a number of secretaries, but I proposed to take a look at the targeted killings. And I said, look, you know, we're, we're, we've been at this for a number of years now with predators and drones. So somebody tell me what uh, I mean, these are all bad people, I got it, they, they deserve to die, but if the strategy ultimately is 
that we are trying to settle, if you will, or settle down this part of the world, and we are trying to rid it of this sort of terrorist and peace, then somebody explain to me how we're getting there. In, in other words, how are we, and I heard somebody talk about this earlier, about you know metrics on the strategic landscape. I think this is a way to think about that, to think about the adversary not as the other, but as someone more like us than we would want to believe or be comfortable believing. So, thanks for the question. Thank you very much. I can't take one question. Uh, I have to postpone uh, the other questions to dinner time. I, I, I beg your pardon and your, for your understanding because uh, the presentation of Professor Münke is ahead. Uh, and I want to grant you at least a 10 minutes break. So, Dr. Bosch, please. Thank you, General. Uh, you mentioned um, and explained very well uh, this issue of reciprocity and the mimicking. Now, I would like to ask, uh, what about capabilities? Some uh, adversary might be in, have the intention to mimic uh, an enemy, uh, its methods and so on, but just doesn't have the capabilities. I mean, um, cyber war conducted by the US and Russia is one thing, mm -hmm. cyber war uh, conducted between the US and, say, Mali and other, uh, other things. Okay, so first let me start with the <laughs> cyber is a place, is one of the capability areas that has a very low cost of entry. And it is very, very asymmetrical. And you don't need to be a large, well-resourced nation state to conduct the kinds of operations that would cause difficulty to other folks. So I think that in terms of the capability, I agree with you on the capabilities if you're talking about conventional kinds of things, but in the world of cyber, not so much, because I think you can have that capability with a, like I said, with a very uh, low barrier to entry. In terms of conventional capabilities, what you would find is if you were a large nation state and you went into a small country, that country's armed forces would very quickly learn, if they didn't before, that if they were to stand and fight you in the way you wanted to, they would be destroyed. So what do they do? They turn it into an insurgency. And now you are faced with a counterinsurgency, which takes away a lot of your capabilities. And, you know, I mean, all the high-tech militaries in the world have discovered this and discover it again over time and time again. Uh, Napoleon had to go bail out his brother in Spain. Hitler moved if I'm not mistaken, it was number, uh, the number is in the teens, I want to say 12 or 14 divisions that he sent into Yugoslavia at the time to put down an insurrection there, a rebellion that didn't go to Moscow. So there's, there are ways that they can do that, but that reciprocity piece is, uh, again, if you look at an insurgency and you look at the history of insurgencies, you find that the longer you stay in there, that involved in that, the more difficult it becomes to tell one side from the other, tactically. So. so thank you again. It was not only an uh, outstanding analysis of Clausewitz, it also was a, a way that you showed us how to apply the results of this analysis into creating leadership, into creating command and control. And therefore, I want to say a very big thank you for this. Thank you very much. Sir. <laughs> Meine Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie ersuchen, eine zehnminütige Pause einzulegen, dass wir uns um 50 pünktlich treffen, weil Professor Münker äh, ersuchen, ob er um zehn Minuten später beginnen kann, ob das in sein Zeitbudget passt. Ich darf Ihnen eine kurze Pause und eine pünktliche Rückkehr wünschen. Dankeschön. <lacht>